Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Adam. How do you like me right in your face? <laughs> I'm not sure this arrangement is working for me. I appreciate the intimacy, but I think we need an extra mic. But for this interview, we are we are stuck with the one. Yeah. I turned 34 and all of my shit broke. It's something about like me and all of my things have come to the end of their youth. <laughs> so speaking of the wisdom of experience, today we have Matt Continetti. He is a resident fellow at AEI and the author of The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. His book, as the title suggests, gives a thorough history of the historical, political, and ideological turmoil that is the American right. He starts his survey at the 1920s and concludes, as many things have, at the ascent of Trump. We actually didn't end up getting into the history as much as we had thought yes. we would. And Matt rightly says, if you want to know the history, just buy the book. So do that. Um, but we did get to kind of unpack the, I guess, philosophical undergirdings of the Republican Party, of the conservative movement uh, and its opposition to the left, as well as kind of the post-liberal trends within it, which are complicating perhaps some of the ideological standings of the, of the right. So it was, it was interesting. And we also towards the end kind of got a little spicy with um, our conversation on hot, like button topics like abortion and which kind of seems to be our trend now. We were just, we just saved the abortion debate for last. Right. Uh, so it got, it got fun. <laughs> Yeah, and I think also it showcased a little bit at a glance, if people are, are paying close attention, the uh, ideological differences between Vanessa and me, which was fun because having a conversation with somebody like Matt, who already, I think, stands at some distance, I guess, although we, we all agree on the importance of procedural democracy, we all have an underlying faith in liberalism. I think Vanessa has been finally converted. You can see that there is at least a triangle of opinions in this one conversation, which I guess that's the, that's the pull point of having uncertain things. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. You know, find some value. Let us know if you did or if there is something that we, you think we missed and we can explore another time. We are uncertain.substack.com or wherever else you get your podcasts. Rate us with five stars and spread the love to your enemies. That's what Jesus uh, would have wanted. <laughs> and without further ado, Matt Continetti. Considering how many articles in the past, I'd say, five years uh, from journalists of, of very different political persuasions try to solve this question of what happened to the right, mm -hmm. having something that some, from somebody who's actually coming from the right, thinking about this and putting the introspective work as well as the historical legwork into this question is <laughs> incredibly valuable. So I, I want to plunge into this whole question of what American conservatism really is, but I want to start with the case made by Calvin Coolidge uh, that you quote in your book that I find the most rousing. He said, and I'm sure, Matt, you can hum along, if all men are created equal, that is final. If they are endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that is final. No advance, no <laughs> progress can be made beyond these propositions. So this is a profound statement about a certain line that should not be experimented with or changed just for the sake of progress in its own name. Okay. But if today you open the news and see the kind of people or the kind of ideas that cloak themselves with conservatism, you discover very different things. So I think the way to start would be from uh, distinguishing the Republican Party of today from the Republican Party of Calvin Coolidge. And that, of course, is uh, the story I tell in the right, um, how how the party changed over the course of 100 years. The Republican Party today includes 
many people, I think, who abide by the principles of Calvin Coolidge and his constitutionalism. But it also has a very large populist faction, um, a faction that believes it's defending the Constitution, but is ready to take extreme measures to do so, and is also tempted uh, sorely by conspiratorial thinking as well as a strongman rule. So unsurprisingly, a common criticism that came up when Trump ascended, a criticism you'd hear on the left was, this is not new. This monster existed in the Republican Party and conservatism all along. This monster being the temptation of authoritarianism, of anti-democratic populism. And so for a lot of journalists on the left, the idea that the right was ever really about constitutionalism and protecting the American tradition of rights and liberties was less than persuasive. That in truth, it wasn't much more than a veneer hiding a will for power. And we can look beyond Trump. You have Representative Lauren Boebert, who says that the Founding Fathers never really cared about separation of church and state, which is, of course, nonsensical. And, and thankfully, her colleague, uh, Adam Kinziger, called it American Taliban. But it comes along with Republicans refusing to denounce an act to undermine the peaceful transition of power, which some might say is uh, inherent to the American tradition. So when you see people like Flynn or uh, uh, Boebert yeah, you can't blame people on the left for finding it hard to see the deferment to history and tradition as less than sincere. Look, I mean, on the religion and public life question, it is the, the fact that the conservative movement uh, has always believed that there should be a place for religion and public life, that religion should not be removed from the public square. Now, that's different from public religion, that is to say, different from the government actively propagating a belief system. But uh, the uh, conservative movement for a long time has opposed uh, mainly judicial and bureaucratic decisions that they feel has basically marginalized religious believers and religious ideas from the public square. This is a longstanding idea. There's now a, a new right in America that believes that the government should be a more assertive um, and in the realm of public religion. And though this is an idea that's taking hold in some quarters of the intellectual right, particularly on the new right, I've seen some uh, elements of the Republican Party, like uh, those represented by Congresswoman Boebert, uh, echo it, but it, I don't believe it's a mainstream Republican belief at this point. You're referring to the post-liberal trend. That's right. This new right uh, which is often discussed, that's um, been shaped by uh, the Brexit vote and the rise of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, it goes by many names. Uh, one group uh, among it is called the post-liberals. Uh, I'd say the majority of its members uh, are associated with the group called the National Conservatives. And um, the leader of that group, the Israeli philosopher Yoram Hazoni has recently published a book on conservatism uh, where he thinks that uh, the government should, should be much more active in the um, uh, propagation of, of biblical religion. Now, that's, that's different, I believe, from simply saying that the government should protect the rights of religious believers, should protect religious freedom, should um, protect the... the um, the idea that religious views have a place in public discourse. Um, but that is uh, clearly, I think, um, uh, where some of the energy on this national conservative right uh, is today. Just to clarify that point, it's one thing to say that my decisions as a lawmaker are informed by my religion, which you know, makes sense because you derive your morality from somewhere. And just to say openly that I take mine from my um, traditional teachings shouldn't disqualify you in any way from the public discourse. That's one thing. It's another to say, I am going to pass laws in order to force society into the mold of my beliefs. In other words, to enforce or prioritize or give primacy to my views, uh, my ethical religious views over others. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think so. I, I mean, again, I, I don't see many people calling for these types of laws. Um, but I would say, uh, not just on the new right, but also among many conservatives in general, there is a belief that 
in recent years, the government itself has been propagating what is essentially a metaphysical belief system. It goes by the name of woke. So you'll see sometimes conservatives and Republicans say that the government should not be propagating those ideas and should instead, if the public square has to be free of all metaphysical beliefs, that also includes the metaphysical beliefs of the progressive left. Matt, I want to ask you, I want to dwell on this question of post-liberalism a little bit, because just to give you some context to, you know, our show and some of the themes that we've been talking about, um, one of the very first questions that Adam and I wanted to grapple with on the show was, why does liberalism matter? Why does liberal democracy matter? Um, Adam comes from a more kind of like history background. And so he had kind of been grappling with this question in terms of uh, philosophy and philosophy background. So he kind of had a sense of why liberalism matters. And I was coming in as kind of like a newbie. And I was, I asked very <laughs> sincerely and naively, like, why do we even need this? Because I'm, I consider myself of the left and I could see a lot of trends um, against kind of more traditional liberal values, I suppose. Um, and so this has been a question that's come up again and again. And I, I would love to know, because I've been seeing the kind of post-liberal post -liberal trend on the left, I would like to hear from you the roots of the post-liberal trend on the right and and I get a little sense of historically how the tension has been in the on the right between embracing uh, liberal democracy versus moving away from it. Thank you for that. I think the way to think about this post-liberal movement on the right is to start from the position that many of the thinkers associated with it are deeply traditional Catholics. As a historian will know, uh, the Catholic Church's relationship with the United States over the centuries has not been uncomplicated. Um, and indeed, there was an effort uh, by American Catholics, both thinkers and politicians, in the middle of the 20th century to reconcile uh, Catholicism with American democratic capitalism. Um, and I'm thinking here of uh, the writer and philosopher John Courtney Murray. And of course, um, John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign was tied up in all of these debates. So there's always been, I think, a strain of Catholic thought, traditionalist Catholic thought, that is very suspicious of the American experiment. And there's also been a response to it from a lot of Americans who have been suspicious of Catholic involvement yes, in the American course. system. Yes. Anti-Catholicism is uh, ever-present in some quarters. Um, to pick up where I left off, these thinkers, and I uh, talk about William F. Buckley Jr.'s brother-in-law, L. Brent Bozell, who started a Catholic journal. Uh, he called it a journal of radical Christianity called Triumph Magazine in the late 1960s as a radical critique of America, uh, of its um, no establishment of religion, of its wide space for individual freedom it grants to the individual uh, for its very um, dynamic and disruptive political economy. Um, so th that's been there. It was there in the syllabus of errors in, in the 19th century. It was there in the mid-60s with the uh, internal Catholic critiques of, say, the Second Vatican Council. And it's there today. And it emerges today in the thought of uh, figures such as Patrick Deneen, Adrian Vermeule, and Saurabh Amari as a response to the legal culture of the United States and the uh, widening of gay rights, same-sex marriage, and uh, transgender ideology. And so the, 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 um, uh, the, the strengthening of these views um, in the public sphere and also the propagation of them by major cultural institutions and even governmental institutions has led this group of thinkers to um, repudiate liberalism in toto. So they don't say that uh, these views are associated with a modification or deformation of liberalism. They say, no, uh, John Locke, the uh, 17th century philosopher uh, who talked about civil society, limited government, constitutionalism, his ideas are why the United States government under democratic administrations flies the pride flag at U.S. embassies overseas. And so they have made this, this um, I think, quite fantastical leap. Um, but that's where it's coming from. It's a response to their perception of cultural loss and their real horror at some of the cultural messages that are um, being broadcast by media 
entertainment, corporations, and um, some sectors of the government as well. So they observe a decline of, of certain values in society and they recognize a series of political losses and their response to it is to understand it not just as the tug and pull of politics or the swinging of the pendulum, a metaphor that I despise, <laughs> but this is the fundamental rot of a pluralistic democracy. Therefore, that needs to be abrogated completely as a system. It's a consequence, yes, of, of liberalism. Their vision of liberalism leaves no room for civil society or association. I know this is I know this is technical. No, no, but, no, no. This is know, exactly ask, what we want. If you ask me, I'm a classical liberal, right? I believe in individual rights. I believe in constitutional government, the rule of law. But I also believe in civil society, the space in between the individual and the state, and all of the mediating institutions that exist between the individual and the state, the family, the church, the community, right? Vocations, the market. And I think it's the job of the conservative to keep all of these different things in balance. Some of the post-liberals, they don't, they, they don't see those institutions in between the individual or the state, or they think that they have been so corrupted by the philosophy of liberalism, there's no reason to, uh, that they're, they're beyond repair. That's why they're radicals. If you're, it's beyond repair, you need to uproot the entire system. A, a classical liberal such as myself doesn't think you need to uproot the entire system. You need to repair what's broken, Right. And build right. up what's working. Like a conservative right. does. <laughs> but that's um, that's not a very popular view on the right these days. It's a self-explanatory fact why the position of classical liberalism, if that's how we're going to call it, is a definitionally lonelier and more difficult position to hold because it doesn't tell you how to live your best life, how to find purpose, how to find direction. It tells you where you're not going to find answers to these questions, but then leaves you to figure it out on your own and construct your own institutions for meaning and community and leave it to you to bring people in. For a lot of people, absent the authority that requires association, they mm -hmm. feel lost. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, right. I mean, I think sometimes classical liberals assume the existence of these intermediary institutions and assume that they're strong. And so I think where, um, where maybe a Burkean perspective comes mm. in and to, to modify classical liberalism is to say, no, they're not, you can't leave them alone, these intermediary institutions. They're, they need to be strengthened. And it, that takes work too. Sometimes it even takes law to do it. But you can't simply think in terms of the individual and the state. You need to kind of supplement classical liberalism with, with an attention to these intermediary institutions. Because it's from those where you actually get your sense of, of meaning and right. purpose that you, that you were talking about. It's from, it's from your family. It's from, it's from your church. It's from your, your, your community, your neighborhood, or your friend group that, that you get a sense of ultimate meaning and purpose. If we leave those institutions to de degrade and decline, then you are going to have people who are feeling alienated and animistic. And that's, I think, um, in some ways, the root of many of our troubles today. So basically, to give the most charitable interpretation of the post-liberal position, from my perspective, even if, even if we can all agree that pluralism and uh, liberal democracy were good in theory, in reality, in their current iterations, under uh, the forces of American capitalism and hyper-individualism, they have thoroughly rotted the most valuable institutions in society and allowed them to crumble. So now we need to turn to the centralized government in order to rebuild those institutions basically from scratch. Yeah, they, you're right to suggest that this link that the post-liberals and the new right perceive between economics and the mediating institutions. So they blame the decline of the family, say, or the, um, the uh, easy access to pornography or um, gender ideology that they oppose. They blame that. Or the right to, to buy any kind of contraception that you want and then go off and fornicate freely. I mean, you'll have to point me to a text. But yeah, they, I mean, some, I guess some of them are, are against contraception too. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to say that 
they are blaming these social developments on an economic system. That's the other, that's another link that, uh, or leap that they make. They're saying it's capitalism is responsible for the degradation of the institutions. And uh, this is where I also part company with them because I don't think that causal link has been established. Um, I, th- I, I follow the sociologist Daniel Bell, who always dis- made distinctions between politics, economics, and the culture. And the, he felt that all three operated independently. They were, they, were, they were related in some ways, but they were operated independently. And I think we can see examples of flourishing capitalist systems where the intermediary institutions are also flourishing. Um, so, so that, but you're right to say for the post liberals, they, um, they go to the economic system and, you know, that's tied up in liberalism too, because part of liberalism, of course, classically understood is property rights and, and exchange, right? So they, so they're pointing to that, but I, I, that's not where I go. This actually touches with something that I've been playing in my head for a while. And I notice it from both the left and the right the post liberals on 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 the wings of both sides that the thing that they seem to often be complaining about when they talk about um economics or even politics to some extent is actually a culture that they don't like when i hear the left and and i guess the right as well complain about the free market they usually talk about the greed and the alienation uh, that that comes with it and the selfishness and that's a culture. You could call it a culture associated with American capitalism, but it's not, that's not the essence of a free market. A free market does not require you to act by purely selfish motivations. That's, that's how certain society may have imbued it. But nothing about free exchange says, thou shalt only consider your own self-interest. Human nature maybe says that. <laughs> but in theory, if you have a culture of strong communal ties, you'll make less selfish decisions, even within the structure of a free market. Uh, I think even with guns, a lot of liberals, their problem with gun culture is the gun culture. It's not, they, they try to legislate it away by saying that uh, thou shalt not have guns, but the the problem is more a reaction to the, I think, the fetishization of guns or the turning of guns into some social toy that is not treated with responsibility, I'd say, that you'd expect. So I think there's a lot of negative casting on on the economic model or the politics of liberalism where the issue at stake is really culture. Just uh, on capitalism, uh, I think I think you're onto something when you mentioned human nature, which is, you know, point, tell me the system the political and economic system under which greed is non-existent. I mean, that's just, it's, it's utopian to think that you could get a different system where humans wouldn't be greedy. Humans wouldn't be selfish. I mean, and that's, that's in some ways the genius of liberalism uh, is that it kind of accepts the reality of, of, <laughs> of human nature and says, well, how can we make the best of this? Right. Um, on the larger question about the role of culture, I, I, I agree. I think there is something there that um, a lot of what's motivating the new right is cultural. Now, they, they tend to move toward economics and they'll say, well, it's kind of, it's globalization is responsible for this culture that I dislike. Um, that might be true in some cases. I, I happen to believe that uh, allowing China a totalitarian state to enter the global trading system was a mistake. Um, there were many conservatives who argued against it at the time in the late 1990s. Um, but I don't, I don't know whether it's as direct a causation as, as some on the new right um, say. I think really what they're, what they're re- responding to and rebelling against is the culture of uh, progressive elites uh, in in the academy, in the media, in entertainment, in boardrooms, more and more, and then under democratic administrations. Yeah, it's funny, Adam. I was just thinking when you were talking, I I shared a, a story recently with Adam about how I used to live in Chile, and I was so surprised when I got there that if somebody opened a packet of gum, it was 
automatically shared with anyone you were around. And it just so surprised me because as an American, I feel like you open a pack of gum, you're not obligated to share it, to share it with the whole like class if you're in class or whatever. And I think like there's not a more like that. The Chilean uh, capitalism is alive and strong, let me tell you. So it's not necessarily capitalism that's influencing that spirit. It's It's a culture. It's a culture that is impacting it. Well, also, if I can just interject, think about uh, immigrants to this to America who tend to form businesses and also tend to have the strongest families. So it's not. And then, by the way, were social conditions in the Soviet Union so great? <laughs> I was waiting for that. I recall mm -hmm. Eastern Europe uh, and, and the Soviet Union uh, dealing with all types of alcoholism, you know, uh, depression. All of it was not so. Mm. I don't see the connection between the political economy and the state of the culture that the new right does, and that your example also uh, uh, illustrates. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and I think it says family values quite as well as ratting out your brother-in-law to the Stasi. Yeah, well, think about Japan. Stasi, I'm yeah. sorry, now you got me on a <laughs> Japan. Japan is the most culturally conservative country, maybe in the world. Okay, uh, and it's also one of the most capitalistic countries in the world. Now they have a welfare state, mm -hmm. and they the, the, they have a government plays some uh, role um, in uh, in industrial policy, say. But it's still a capitalist country, and they still have uh, a very mm -hmm. uh, conservative culture. So it, it, that, this just the direct mm -hmm. causation, I think, just doesn't work. As an Israeli, yeah, or or, or Israel. I mean, of course, becoming more capitalist lately. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, it, it, yes. It, and I, so in Israeli, actually, it's, that's something that I do think of as an interesting experiment because you do see a trend towards more capitalism that feels foreign to an Israeli who grew up there in mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s and certainly people who grew up during the kibbutz era. Um, a lot of the trends of the past 10 years, uh, largely, I think, uh, um, spearheaded by Netanyahu, have liberalized the economy and it's just to show how difficult words are. And I, I do see some cultural change that comes along with it. But um, if you want to be rigorous, it's not simply saying, well, capitalism made people more greedy or more selfish. But first of all, maybe, maybe a growing desire to accrue capital has made the country more capitalistic, um, which comes with more, um, you know, a, a willingness to work longer and have social ambition and maybe sacrifice some of your uh, personal life for the sake of work and, and um, fortune building, maybe. But I think that there is a funny corollary, and this is maybe my bias of looking primarily at culture influence, I think there is a pro there remains a process in Israel of trying to imitate things in the U.S. and in a way that kind of tries to take the whole package of what the America seems um, to foreigners, and sometimes it even means taking on some tacky aspects from American culture or, or a tacky simulacrum of some behaviors in the U.S. that make no sense outside of it. For instance you'd hear in the past three, four years, people talking about Second Amendment rights in Israel, which has zero amendments because it doesn't have a constitution. But you hear real policymakers, real journalists talking about it. And this is just imitation. So if anything, I would say that the fact that Israeli culture is going along on more American lines is because it's imitating the culture not or trying to thinking that having the culture is a prerequisite in order to achieve the American success story that they're aspiring to. But yeah, sorry, that, that was a whole tangent. Yeah, and of course, Israel, you know, I mean, it's not like the United States, as you know, and the place of religion is very different in Israel as the Jewish state. Mm. And, um, and so I think just to point to another difficulty with the new right and the post-liberals, I mean, they're the public religion that they would like the United States to uh, espouse um, they say, as Hazoni says in his book, conservatism, would be the majority religion, right? Um, and if so in Israel, of course, and he is an Israeli, uh, that's, that's Judaism, and it's, um, that's the religion of Israel. Um, in America, though, how would that work? I mean, one, 
to the degree that there is a plurality or, uh, uh, or um, it, it's Protestant, right? Which is ironic since many of the thinkers on this new right are Catholics. So, so it's not as though that they're going to immediately be able to espouse Catholicism. Uh, they're, a, they're a minority in the country. What's more, they're a minority in their own church. Most Catholics in America are, do not uh, subscribe to the ultra-traditionalism of these thinkers. And, and plus, America is, is much more pluralistic, always has been, has a tradition of religious pluralism on the basis of its um, non-establishment clause. So uh, I think there, too, it's just translating what the system maybe in Israel say, or, of course, as many of the national conservatives uh, fixate on, the system as it exists in Hungary, right, a very Catholic country, <laughs> to the United States, just, it doesn't work. Yeah, I, I find when I read Hazoni that he seems to be overstating the viability of really <laughs> importing the sort of unique balance of a religious history, which is often more cultural mm -hmm. than it is actually religious, um, and secular nationalism yeah. that exists in Israel and that defines a lot of the bonds uh, between Israelis, which is also obviously exacerbated by a very real existential right. uh, dread right. that underlies every moment in life. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as we know with human behavior, enhances the sense of belonging and, and tribal loyalty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he overstates how viable this is being imported to the U.S. kind of like the way that Bernie Sanders talks about Denmark as if that's just a easily replicable economic system. I, I find this baffling sometimes because he makes some really profound, thoughtful points, but I constantly feel that it suffers from this recurring bias that assuming that the Israel, Israeli model is something that can just be exported to the world somehow. So if I can just expand on this uh, for a moment. That's why I think it's very important for American conservatives to, to, to emphasize the Americanness of their conservatism. Conservatives in America need to feel home, at home in America. They need to recognize that this is our country and they need to defend the country, our country. And that country is very unique. It is not Israel. It is not Hungary. It is not... It's not Japan, for sure. It's not Brazil, which many people draw parallels between the United States and Brazil. We have a very unique country with its own history, right? And we should pay attention to those traditions and principles and look, look to them for guidance rather, rather than trying to import systems from overseas into our own. And since you just noted about the the need for a, a, an American conservatism. Um, there, I think you have a line in the book that says something along the lines of the job of the conservative is to remember or at least continually rediscover America, right? And I think you're in a lot, a large part referring to a rediscovery of the Constitution, but not exclusively, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so to what extent do you think people on the right agree with you <laughs> that this is the job of the conservative? Um, and if, if they do, uh, how well are they doing on that, on that task? Well, I, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting that in recent conversations, many people, uh, people have, have been drawn to that line. Um, but it's typically not conversations with conservatives. You would think that conservatives would be, um, interested in the past. And I'm a conservative who's very interested in the past and traditionalists, you would think, be interested in the past. But um, right now, I think most of the right is focused on the present uh, uh, rather than the past. Um, and you're right. I, when I say that the job of a conservative is to remember, or I say that, or I quote William F. Buckley Jr., which was the other part of what you're saying, where he said that, you know, for the conservative needs to engage in this continual rediscovery of America. You start with the Constitution and the Declaration, the Bill of Rights, the Federalist Papers, but you don't end there. The American political tradition is continuous uh, over these some 250 years. It includes Lincoln. It includes Frederick Douglass. It includes um, uh, FDR. Martin Luther King Jr., Ronald Reagan, and it, and you need to have, a, I think, a very expansive view of it uh, to understand what it is that makes America uh, worth defending from a conservative perspective. 
And I think that the through line through all of those figures I mentioned uh, is is freedom and equal rights. That is, those concepts are, I think, uh, embedded in all aspects of the American political tradition. And so those should be our lodestars um, as we think about the challenges facing our country today. To what extent does rediscovering America also means accepting voices that were once radical or that were once on the left um, oppositional and maybe even on a literal way anti-American, let's say Malcolm X, for instance, and re-understanding its role and its importance in the bigger story that is America. Right. Well, I think you should be aware of aware of those voices. Um, uh, in fact, it, as I was going through my catalog, I was, I was just thinking to myself, you know, where does someone like Gene Debs fit in, right? Um, uh, but I think I think where you where I would disagree kind of about inclusion or what the conservative ought to defend would be when figures turn anti-American. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I was pushing that point. Because I seem like if we're talking about civil rights, uh, Martin Luther King, that's that's an easy one, right? Malcolm X, that becomes yeah. more challenging. Yeah, it does. I mean, obviously, no one should pretend that Malcolm X didn't exist. And, and we should all pay attention to his... Uh, his arguments and uh, what he stood for. In some ways, he was a uh, small C conservative, right? I mean, I would argue. I would argue that some of the backlash against the backlash, or whatever you want to call it, the the anti CRT laws that have been passing um, yeah. in some legislatures. I, I don't know if they specifically treated Malcolm X, but they do show a willingness to. Um, elide, ignore, expurgate parts of American history, right? Yeah, there are some some of the proposed legislation I think has gone too far. Sometimes the proposed legislation is not the same as the past legislation, so people should be aware of that. Right, right, right. Proposed legislation is for the cameras. I, I do believe that American history ought to be taught in the fuller round, which means that you include the bad as well as the good. But you have to have both. And I think, I think the trend... Um, Uh, up until the past year or so was in just emphasizing the bad and not recognizing the good. And you have to have both in my view. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you this question about the status quo. I guess Mm -hmm. it's, it's sometimes I get confused with the terminology in terms of Republican party versus the right. And I I recognize that there's different, but if we suggest that the Republican party has historically been aligned on the right, there was an assumption that that, that they stood for the status quo, essentially that that was kind of a defining change, like though the tension with the left is that they're going to push for change and the right is going to say, you know, what we have is strong and uh, special and we need to maintain it in some way. And that kind of push pull is the, in, in some ways, the American project. Um, you were talking earlier about, you know, the post liberals, for example, kind of wanting to blow up the status quo a little bit. Uh, obviously they don't represent the Republican party writ large or the right writ large, but do you think that there is a kind of transition happening? I mean, could you say that the left is now the party of the status quo and the right is is becoming less so? I think that's a complicated question uh, because of those definitional issues that you mentioned mm. at the outset. I would say this, that um, I think you could argue that the Republican Party was the party of the status quo in the 1920s when I begin my history. Um, but after... Uh, the Great Depression and FDR's election and the creation of the New Deal order, um, it's difficult to say that the conservative movement was for the status quo. Uh, when the conservative movement came into uh, form, formation after the uh, Second World War, it was explicitly against the status quo, the status quo represented by, represented by FDR and the New Deal and in some ways ratified by Eisenhower and his modern Republican Party. So that's what made, for example, the nomination of Barry Goldwater to the Republican presidential ticket in 1964 so important, was because it was the first time in 30 years that the Republican Party had nominated someone who considered themselves a conservative, right? And Barry Goldwater, 
you read his book published in 1960, The Conscience of a Conservative, he did not represent the status quo. <laughs> he wanted he wanted the things to change majorly. Um, so I, I see how you know we can we often say, oh, conservatives for the status quo, and uh, liberals or radicals are for for change. That I think works on a philosophical level, but once we we kind of translate it to the realities of American politics over the last hundred years, it becomes a little bit more difficult. You know, so what is the status quo in America today? I don't. Um, uh, I think you're you're right to say that in some sense it is a progressive status quo. Uh, the, the the architecture of the New Deal, of course, still exists um, with the, just one real modification. Uh, uh, over the last hundred years, and that's the end of the uh, the welfare program as it existed up until 1996. Um, and uh, we see, for example, in recent uh, Supreme Court decisions, that the status quo, uh, the legal the legal status quo, was very uh, favorable to um, progressive beliefs, say uh, about abortion um, or guns or um, even in the most recent case uh, that came out about um, the Environmental Protection Agency, the, the nature of uh, the bureaucracy, the administrative state. So um, that, I, think, I think there you can see how the right in America is pushing for change because it wants to, it wants to return to an earlier status quo, uh, the status quo of uh, over 50 years ago um, in the case of uh, abortion. Um, and uh, over uh, uh, almost 100 years ago in the case of the way in which uh, the bureaucracy takes its cues from the Congress. When Vanessa um, mentioned this question to me, I, I was also just starting to, like, trying to figure out where I stand on it in my head. One of the problems, even thinking about this from, again, from the outside a little bit, the position of a conservative that seems to be reliant on some form of nostalgia, right? Because the idea isn't to completely, for most conservatives, I assume, to completely reimagine America, but rather to try and recapture some quality that they define as the right equilibrium, the, cor- the, the, the right status quo to return to, rather than completely, you know, start from scratch, I have a new idea, hear me out fellas so how do you land on the moment in history that you think is worth preserving i'm sure you have a moment in time that if frozen captures the values of um an american project worth defending and you've reached that idea through scholarship and study but you also have people on the right who seem to be attached to conservatism only in rhetoric they claim to be hearkening back to some tradition that they imagine, but they're really trying to actuate, to realize an America that never really existed. Can we even call all of this conservatism? Is this coalition real? Maybe the way to answer your question is to talk about actually when I, how far I do want to turn the, the clock back. And that, that's a joke. That's a joke conservatives tell each other, which is you could see what kind of conservative you are by how far you want to turn the clock back. Right, right. right. I think something went wrong in the United States in 1968. Uh, I think that um, the, uh, basically the New Deal political order um, uh, came apart in 1968 and it's never been repaired and I think American liberalism changed in 1968 into something very different than it was prior to that. And um, I, I think uh, I think uh, conservatives need to uh, try to uh, fix uh, what what went wrong. Um, and uh, I think that means one kind of this rediscovery of America we've been talking about and uh, pride in our country and in our institutions and what we have been able to achieve. Number two, a re-emphasis on uh, equal opportunity, individual liberty, and equality before the law, uh, rather than um, preferential treatment based on group characteristics. Um, And three, a reassertion of representative government against 
um, a bureaucratic and juridical rule. Uh, whereas, you know, we've left so many decisions to the judges and the bureaucracies over the last 50 years. And I think it's important for Congress to reassert itself as the people's house uh, and reclaim these issues, to repoliticize them. And, um, and you know, they may, they may end up in a consensus that is more liberal than I would prefer, but that, to me, it's the mechanism that matters. It's the process. Right, so you're about procedural democracy. Yes, yes. I'm a, I think conservatives should be firm believers in constitutional proceduralism uh, because it's, that's the system that was set up uh, in right. 1787. And, and this is something that I think we are now, are, I mean, for better or for worse, we're, we're going to see it happening, right? I hope. To some extent. Yes, I think that's, that's a result of the Dobbs decision this past week. Yeah. Right. Uh, for, you know, the reversal of the Roe precedent on abortion in the Supreme Court, returns that issue to politics. It had been removed from politics for 50 years. That is to say, there was no way in which the people's representatives could uh, have their say in, in, in the administration of that ruling. Now, at the state level, there are going to be 50 different conversations and then a federal conversation as well about how we regulate abortion in, this, in, the, in, the, in the country. And so... I, I, I think that, from my perspective, was a victory for the original understanding of the Constitution because I want issues to be debated in, mm -hmm. in, in, this, in the public square. And I want legislatures to decide these important issues rather than judges and bureaucracies. So, and I think, I think in the last 50 years, it's been the judges and the bureaucracies that have asserted their will. And that's actually one of the major reasons we're dealing with this populist upsurge at the moment. Mm. I, guess, I guess one of my questions with with the recent Dobbs Jackson ruling is, and and I'm you know again I'm from the left and so I'm I'm consuming left media, but the the feeling is that you know my rights have been peeled back, right? But and and it's just it's and especially in terms of kind of Supreme Court rulings that historically when you do repeal something, it's in service of providing broader rights, not restricting rights. Um, and so I'd love I'd love to hear. I mean, you, you said earlier that the lodestars of the of the right are freedom and equal rights. Yeah. Um, how does it square when the the, the this this ruling, despite the fact that it gives back um, kind of uh, the opportunity for political debate on this issue, it also at the same time for a lot of the population, it also restricts what they conceived as as, as a right. Right. Well, uh, I'd say the first thing is the ruling doesn't take away any rights. The the ruling restores the issue to the political process. So there will be legislatures, as as we all know, who are going to restrict the abortion procedure. And so the left... It doesn't impose restrictions, but it does eliminate it as a given right. It says there's no right to it in the Constitution. Yes. Which is facially true. So that so then it's left to the legislatures and from the left's perspective or the pro-choice perspective. There used to be a pro-life left tradition in this country. So from the pro-choice perspective, then that would mean, yes, that be the restriction or in some cases the elimination. Um, very few cases in the two states, I think, so far have, have totally banned abortion, or at least want to. This, what the issue is so different than other issues, as was as Justice Alito says in the opinion, uh, because there is two lives involved. There is the mother, and then there is the unborn child, and so this is from the pro-life perspective. I will say, it's not actually a restriction of right. It is the granting of the right to life. It, it is a liberty issue for the unborn child. And I understand that that's very con uh, contested, what I just said. That's, that's a very contested assertion. But what I'm trying to do is to describe to you that from the pro-life side of things, it is completely consistent with individual liberty and equal opportunity. Because in this one case, it's not just, it's, it's not just about the mother it's also about the unborn life. Which, of course, strains or challenges the validity of politicizing that question, right? Because if, if we, both sides agree that there are rights at issue, but this is a very dangerous thing to, 
to just leave to political discussion, right? The Civil War happened because we needed to agree on who counts as human and who doesn't. And this is the question at the heart of the abortion debate. I would say that um, just because, I mean, rights are obviously, you know, you know regulated, right? So um, I think where this issue will land eventually after, after many years uh, will be where many people think it started mistakenly in the Roe decision which is to say people believe that what Roe did was say, was legalize abortions in the first trimester, submit them to regulations in the second, and outlaw them in the third. It didn't do that. It legalized them for all nine months of pregnancy. And as we've revealed, uh, it has been discussed in, in recent election cycles, sometimes even after delivery. So um, I think what the American public wants is the access to abortion or the availability of abortion in the early part of pregnancy and then increasing restrictions after that. And I think that's where we'll end up um, uh, as a result of this being repoliticized, being replaced into the legislative process. Um, and I, from my perspective, uh, I think that uh, pro-lifers should recognize that reality and accept it. You're right to say that there are more maximalist positions. Uh, and that's where you, you see some arguments on the right that actually this decision was flawed, that the court should have said that the unborn child has a 14th Amendment right to life. And so there would be no abortion. Uh, I, I think that goes too far. Um, we have uh, one minute, and uh, <laughs> we, we, we got to the real uh, yeah. right, and stuff we right at the end. Yeah. So, so, so I guess this is. Uh, so, can you tell me the history of isolationism? Oh uh, 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 no, we no. can talk for a few more. We can go over for a few more minutes if you want to address a different subject. We hardly got to tap into your uh, actual history that you present in the book. So, so people could read the book; they'll get the history from the book. Th yeah. th that's true. So I guess okay. So so here's um, a version of the question that we've been playing all around with. I, I mentioned the criticism that the monster was always there, that the tendencies towards authoritarianism were were always evident in parts of the right. And I'm sure that the, a fair response is that it always was part of the left as well. So you can say the allure of authoritarianism exists in politics, period. Um, so we talked a little bit about the new right and the Catholic connection, but obviously the, the populist strand precedes that by a lot. So can you talk about the origins of the populist right and are we all bound to be swept by it? I think we have to recognize that populism is part of the American experiment and that American political mm -hmm. tradition right. that I was discussing earlier in the program. Populism is part of it. I mean, it's there yeah. from the very beginning, from the, from the original Tea Party to the Tea Party of 2009. Um, so I, I think populism emerges. As is revolution and radicalism. Right, yeah. Um, I think populism emerges uh, for two reasons. One, elites, uh, the people in charge, are missing something. They just are blind to something happening. And two, they're getting something wrong. And so I think that the phase of populism that was uh, visible in the 90, 1990s, but truly burst onto the scene after the global financial crisis and Great Recession in 2009 was, one, a, a critique of elites who were missing the costs of globalization to everyday people, uh, the costs not only in what happens to a community where when its anchor industry is outsourced, but also to the uh, social calamity that can ensue uh, when these mediating institutions we were talking about disappear. And so the example I give here is, you know, most people in Washington on the Republican side were not really aware of the opioid crisis until Republicans began campaigning for president in 2015. It's just <laughs> it hadn't reached them because I, I live in the Beltway. Uh, we're a bubble here. You know, obviously we have our own problems because we do have a drug problem, crime problem, but it's not as bad 
as it is in other places in the country. So elites were just blind to it. And the issue that I think that um, the elites were getting wrong and the populists were saying, you're getting this wrong, is the issue of illegal immigration and immigration more broadly to the United States. And that is, um, since uh, Reagan's immigration reform in 1986, uh, both parties had been uh, pretty accepting of immigration and um, kind of uh, ambivalent about um, illegal migration through the southern border. Um, and the populists who showed up uh, to oppose President Bush's um, immigration reforms in his second term were saying, stop, stop this. It's, it's too much. Uh, and the fact that neither party, no Beltway elite, was talking about the costs of globalization or talking about stopping illegal immigration rather than regularizing the status of those who have come here illegally brought Donald Trump to power. So that's, that's where, that's where I think the current populism emerged, came from. And I don't think it's going to uh, subside until those two issues uh, are addressed successfully. But the question is, are those fundamentally the issues? And I have this debate with um, uh, a friend of the pod, Batya Ungar Sargon, a lot, whether the impact of globalization really is the root cause. It surely is part of it. And it's impossible to deny that some of the appeal of Trump with many people is because he was able to address a real dread about the harm caused by globalization truly felt by a lot of people who should not be maligned as racist or xenophobic. But there are also people who would join the, the, the Trump train because it legitimizes their cultural anxiety. And it's not necessarily xenophobia, but just a fear of cultural change, which is very different from economic anxiety and uh, can metastasize into bigotry. Now, Democrats and, and the media have done majestic work batching all these people together and sweepingly declaring them racist and deplorable, which is as amoral as it is political malfeasance. But the amorality and failure of the Democratic Party and, and the media doesn't mean that some of those darker elements aren't there from forms of anti-democracy and bigotry, anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that get absorbed into the bigger movement. And I guess my question is, thinking of Buckley drawing lines in the sand to keep the Bircher Society out, how much should a party be responsible to discern and sift out those elements to the extent that you agree that they even exist? Well, I think you have to start um, from the recognition that... Um, in headed into the 2016 cycle, the only candidate who was talking about, say, cons constructing a border wall um, between the United States and Mexico uh, was someone who most people initially dismissed as a clown show, as a freak. And that the um, kind of heir apparent in 2016 was uh, Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida, brother to George W. Bush, uh, and Jeb's plan was uh, extremely pro-immigration uh, um, and um, didn't really address the, the concerns about security or immigration levels that, that, that many uh, voters have. Um, so uh, I guess I, I would say that the existence of these dark elements, uh, while they need to be suppressed, uh, shouldn't delegitimize the issue um, overall. No, but I grant you that completely. Right. But the reverse should also be true. The fact that establishment Republicans of yore and the Democrats have done such a bad job of distinguishing serious concerns from 
more frothy tendencies doesn't mean that the bigotry doesn't exist and inform some of those um, yeah. anti-immigration well, politics. I agree with you. Right. No, and my, and my, right. And so my question is, if we are trying, because we, we are talking about um, incorporating populist anxieties, populist concerns into the mainstream or, rec- or using that to recognize where the mainstream had blind spots, how do you do that without, oh, well, while still making sure to create a line? That's why I was um, thinking of Jeff Buckley, of creating that line between the groups that should not be allowed in or the voices that are still, that still belong outside the pale. I think it's very hard to do on the immigration issue um, simply because it's, you know, it is tied up with uh, who do we, <laughs> who, does, who do we allow uh, into the country? But I have to say, I mean, you don't do what is happening now, which seems to me a complete kind of abandonment uh, of, of the border or a kind of a, a reversal of the policies that seem to have reduced uh, unauthorized border crossing uh, simply because they were associated with the previous Republican president. Yes. Not only that, tr- hoping that the Supreme Court is going to save you from having to make a choice on the matter. Biden didn't have to do what he did on day one that uh, caused the the huge crisis, which has been going on really. I mean, it, I think he was asked about it at his first press conference in March of 2021. It's over a year now. And we just have this week where we, we talk um, those uh, awful, uh, awful victims of human trafficking uh, uh, found in the truck in Texas. He didn't have to do that. He could stop doing it today, uh, but he won't. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I guess I, you know, I I live by that old adage that when you're in a hole, stop digging and then right, and no. then figure out how to you know, get out of it. You won't hear me defending Biden policies on, or I don't know if any, but certainly not on the border. The reason I think I'm I'm pressing this point is because one of the difficulties in getting people from the liberal side, Democrats on the left to get along with some sort of border compromise is that anxiety on on their part that a lot of what we're doing is actually just laundered racism well to some extent you can you can brush it off and say well the left has been calling everything racist and that's their go-to and it's true if you go through the history of the podcast this is something that we criticize often but I think that if we want to actually, and I think that's our ultimate desire, to put more faith in the, the power of procedural democracy, which relies on compromise, which relies on an interaction between right and left to make some real policy, you'll need to do some work of weeding out the darker elements on both sides in order to create some trust. Part of it is definitely to delegitimize those on the left who would call anything and everything racism, bigotry, etc., without any good cause. But... Part of it should also, I think, be more honest where bigotry does exist and show our readiness to prevent it from gaining power. Yeah, I would just say a few things. One is, you know, is the Canadian immigration system racist? Is the Australian immigration system (laughs) racist? Uh, Is the immigration system of Western European democracies racist? Because that's kind of the immigration system where many on the right want to go to in all those places. And I don't think that... Canada, the Canadian immigration system is racist, for example. So I, I think that's one response. Um, second response is, you know, um, a lot of this opposition to what's happening on the border, or rather uh, is concerns about national security. Mm-hmm. And I do think that it was very effective of Donald Trump in 2016 to tie in the public mind illegal immigration to international terrorism, all right? And um, that, you know, if people are worried about national security and the response from whomever, left or right, um, is, well, that's just racist, I, that, that's not going to fly. I mean, it's just, it just politically, it's um, f- foolish and it's not correct in, most ca- in almost every case, you know. Is, um, so... Uh, there are other factors at work here. I will push back that there has been uh, an overuse of the 
everything's a national security concern in the past 20 years in the US on, on some parts of the right and the left, I think, almost as much as the left has been overusing the identity card. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, yeah, that doesn't mean that people won't say that they're worried about national security. No, no, but, right, right, right. But, uh, but I think our, our ideal is to actually to cut through just the, the, the political rhetoric that at some point actually undermines uh, the position, which is what I'm trying to do with the left, um, to the point where, okay, what are, are the, the true concerns? Is it really national security concerns that, that def, um, um, underlie some of the um, calls for border reform? There are a lot of real concerns for personal security, for sure. But national security to me implies war. Is that, is that on the same level? I, I don't know. Uh, I mean... And I'm Israeli. You know, I'm the, all yeah, for I was going to really say, you're Israeli, really, you know, there's a security, security fence, you know. So uh, I think many Americans would point to that example. Yep, but the comparison could also be facile and specious sometimes. But I guess yeah, that's a whole other discussion. So I, I guess, uh, Vanessa, want to do blind spots? Oh, this is the question we like to ask at the end of our interviews. Um, what do you see as the biggest blind spots of the left and the biggest blind spots on the right? Uh, you know, it's funny. I think uh, one of the biggest blind spots on the left today is bizarrely uh, class. They don't, they don't, they don't see class. They only see race and gender. Um, and so uh, that rings true uh, to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that's a big blind spot on the right. The blind spot um, is America. Is the fact that you know they're. 48%, 50% of the country doesn't agree with them. That doesn't mean the people who disagree with the right are, uh, are un-American or anti-American. They're still Americans. Mm. Um, they, you know, uh, they have reasons for their beliefs. And I, I think the right needs to pay more attention to them. I think the reason why Republicans lost the presidential election of 2020 was uh, the presidential candidate thought that he only needed his own supporters to win re-election. And that was wrong. Uh, he needed, he needed the rest of America. He needed the suburbs. He needed independence. And so I think right now the right needs to think about winning those voters over to its cause. It may win them by default this year. Um, but they need to think about how they could actually meet those voters where they are. Um, and right now they're kind of, going down rabbit holes instead. Matt, thank you so much. This was incredibly fun. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. We are uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Remember, there is more content for you if you are a paid subscriber. We understand if not, inflation is a bitch. But in the meantime, share us with your friends and enemies and spread the word. Until next time, stay sane.